so in this webinar, it's called Using Open UK Data Service Sense Support Datasets in Open Source GIS Software. As Jill said, my name is James Crone. I work for the UK Data Service Sense Support up here in Edinburgh. I'm actually part of ADENA um, at the in, um, Information Services Group, where we provide and support various online services dealing with geospatial data. So what we're going to look at is the range of open data that is available for download for the UK Data Service Centre support. Um, I'm also going to look at other sources of open geospatial data that can be combined with UK Data Service Centre support data. And these are from various other organisations like the Ordnance Survey or the Office of National Statistics. And then we're going to provide a brief introduction to open source GIS software before doing specific demonstrations of using um, centre support data in the PostGIS Spatial Database as our data store and using the QGIS Desktop GIS application to do some mapping and some better spatial analysis. Particularly, we're going to, take, we're going to create chloroplast maps, cartograms, and flow maps using QGIS. I'm just going to give you a bit of background about the UK Data Service Centre support. We're part of the main UK data service. Within Centre support, we provide access to and use support for data from the last five UK population censuses. There are decennial censuses from 1971 to 2011 across the whole of the UK. Um, the majority of the data provided by the UK Data Service Sense Support is available as open data, whereas in the past, although some of the data was only was restricted to academics, and now most of it is open data. As well as the core census data, we also provide um, various other non-census data sets which can help with you when you're doing analysis on the census data to get extra context to that data. If you've not been to our website, there's a link on the bottom here which you can look at later on. Um, so what is open data? Some brief descriptions. Basically, it's, it's any data that anyone can use, access and share. Um, it, should, it should ideally be provided in a sort of a common machine-readable format. And there must, what's special open data is it must be licensed. So it's clear that how people can use that data and then remix it and then combine it with their own stuff. This is just a definition of the European Data Portal. If you could do a Google search for the European Data Portal, you can find information about them. Within the UK Data Service Centre Support, all our open data is provided under the Open Government Licence, which is a UK, um, is a UK thing for license of open data. As part of the UK OGL, it's called the OGL. Whenever you reuse the data, you're supposed to acknowledge the source of the data and if possible provide a link to the OGL. In terms of the types of census data that provided for the UK data service center support, it breaks down to four sort of key data set types. There's the aggregate census area statistics data, and this is the tables. So this is like all the this is the core census data from 1971 through to 2011. And there's lots of lots of variables and lots of combinations of data you can get about individuals that was gathered during the census days. There's the census interaction data, which is flows between places. So that's like um, it could be commuter flows. So where do people live and where do they work, um, as well as migration stuff. There's census micro data, which is um, detailed uh, longitudinal information about people. And as well as that, we have supporting data sets. This includes boundary data sets and geographic lookup tables. So these allow people to map the census data and to create maps and spatial analysis and also to, do, to use geography as a way of um, linking that census data to other data sets. I don't, if most people use the UK data as their census support, they may have seen the Infuse and Casual applications. These are the UK data service census support applications that allow people to download the aggregate data. Um, Infuse will allow you to download the 2001-2011 data across the UK. And the Infuse pe the, the people living in UK data service center support have done a lot of work on Infuse. So it allows you to download data from across the UK and they've done a lot of work to harmonize it. The data from England, Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland. So in some respects, the Infuse thing is quite unique and powerful. To get the earlier data from 1991 to 71, you have to use the earlier incarnation of the application called CASWeb. There's also, to access the flow data, we have a separate application called Wicked, and that will allow you to download flow data. Again, that's the that information of pure migration that's been captured as part of the census. We also have boundary download applications, which will allow you to download this supporting data. 
So here we have the boundary data selector application, and will allow us to download census boundaries, which you can use to map some of our census data sets. We also have an easy download application, which just provides the pre-canned version of the boundaries, so you get less control. You can't you can't specify which geographic area you want. You just get the entire country. Again, in in in, in Infuse and the boundary data selector, most of the data that is sensitive is all OGL. Within um, Wicked, some of the data is OGL, and but others is more restricted depending on the level of geography in terms of the migrations. Some other sources of data that you can use from other organizations is the Office of National Statistics Open Geography Portal. Um, they allow you to download boundaries as well as postcode directories. And I think the emphasis on the ONS is to provide access to contemporary data sets. So you can, you can see here, for example, you can get data for 2017 of like uh, clinical commissioning groups, that's their health geography, which you might be able to use as contextual information for our census data. The thing to work with the, watch for the open job report a little is it has less support for older census boundaries, such as the 71 and 81. So in that case, you're still better off getting that data from the UK Data Service census support. Another great source of open data is the Ordnance Survey itself. The Ordnance Survey is Britain's national mapping agency. And they have an open data initiative where you can access um, a whole variety of geospatial data sets, including backdrop mapping, um, postcodes, boundaries, gazetteers. They also have like um, free, free versions of some of their um, high, high, highly, um, their high quality data sets, which are really useful to provide background context to the census data. It's going to give a, back, a background to GIS. So GIS stands for Geographic Information System, and it's basically a way of um, it's an information system for um, modeling the real world. It tends to come to two distinct um, views of GIS. There's vector GIS and there's raster GIS. Vector GIS consists of um, the real world modeled mod mod in terms of points, lines, and polygons. In raster, it's like a it is a, it's a regular grid. Um, so you can imagine that it could be an aerial photograph or like a, a digital terrain model. And there's just different ways of of, of storing the geographic data, and then you can run different types of analysis on them and manipulation. Typically, a GIS may end up as a, a, a desktop application, which allows you to store that GIS data to manipulate it. So, you, for example, you'd capture over lines and polygons to do some sort of create maps from that data, do some sort of analysis. Uh, and this is, is the, this is the QGIS application, which we'll be using today to use some of our census data. Um, GIS is a big world. There's a lot of different technologies, so we're just going to show some of them. Specifically, if you want to look at how census data is stored within a GIS, here's a typical some aggregate data at the top left here. So we have like um, you have these things called geographic identifiers. These uniquely identify each of the small area geographies, which could be an output area, which the census statistics we produced for. Here we have like a bunch of we have three different census variables. We have total population and male and female, and that just tells us the number of people that are males or females within that small area. And then we can also get the digital boundaries. These are the digital boundaries that represent the actual um, census output areas on the ground. And by tying, relating the census statistics to the boundaries, we can create maps and do spatial analysis, as well as using the power of geography to link in other geographic data sets. To say location brings context. So by linking the stats to the boundaries and geography, you can use geography as a common key to bring in other data sets. In the GIS world, you tend to come with a lot of common data set formats, like the shape file and CSV files to store the attributes. So what is open GIS software? Well, we so if we first look at what is open source software itself, it's computer software is available with a license in which the copyright holder provides the rights to study, change, and distribute their software to anyone and for any purpose. And it's often developed in a public collaborative manner. This is in contrast to sort of non-open source software, which may have a commercial company may develop, in which they do all the bug fixing and testing internally and don't ex allow others to the, the community to feed into that development. So open source GS software is just a special flavor of open source software targeted towards the manipulation of geographic information and data within the OS Within the open source GIS community, one of the major is a company, an organization called the Open Source Geospatial Foundation, the OSGEO, 
which is a non-profit organization whose mission is to support the collaborative development of open source geospatial software and promote its widespread use. So they have like a number of, um, they're like a banner organization, and there's a number of like different software applications that sit within them, and they, um, they provide support and look after the development of these applications. They also run a very good conference every year, which tends to move around the world. And they have like local chapters, and so for example, there's a UK chapter which has its own conference and stuff. And again, if you're just getting started open source GIS software, their website's a great place to start. So there are also there are different types of open source GIS software, and these are aimed at different types of user or application. So from the top to the bottom, there are the core geospatial libraries. These are what you developers developers would, developers would use to write other types of software and to add new features to those software. There are the desktop applications, such as QGIS, which allow end users to manipulate GIS data and create maps. There are web mapping um, software, which allows uh, people to do online mapping and of the data. And then these two at the bottom are more sort of um, related to the actual management of the data itself. And so there's some metadata catalogs. That metadata is data about data. So it's how you describe that data and how you make it discoverable by other people. And again, there are JS open source applications which help with that sort of stuff. Um, today, we're going to look at two main um, open source GIS software applications. We're going to look at using PostGIS as a spatial database in which to store some of our census data. And then we're going to use QGIS to connect to PostGIS and do some mapping and some to create various types of, um, of visualizations of our census data. So just to start off with PostGIS, um, let's say to, to get in terms of getting started with what PostGIS is itself. So PostGIS adds GIS functionality and data types to the PostgreSQL spa uh, database. So PostGRES itself is like a type of database. It's an open source database, but it doesn't it, it but it, it comes with sort of like um, supports for geometries, but it doesn't have the full tool GIS functionality as part of it. So the idea is you have PostGIS on top of Postgres, and then you get like the full ability to store GIS data in Postgres. And you can also do all your GIS data processing analysis using spatial SQL. So you can write SQL to query that spatial data in PostGIS, Postgres. And then you can have other applications that talk to your Postgres database in order to access your GIS data. And it says PostGIS is part of the OSGO umbrella of software. So in terms of how you go around getting PostGIS, the prerequisite is a Postgres installation. You can install Postgres and PostGIS on a number of software platforms, including um, Windows, Macs, and Linux, etc. On Windows, it's actually pretty easy to install. Um, Postgres itself comes with these um, executables you can just run to install. Postgres database on your Windows desktop. And then there's a thing called the, the Stack Builder, which will allow you to install additional parts to Postgres, such as PostGIS on top of that Postgres database. So it's actually fairly simple to get straight straightforward to, to install a PostGIS on your Windows machine. I think for Linux, you can make it as difficult as easy as you want to, depending on how you want to install it. And again, for Macs, there are different options. So I, I've got a PostGIS installed on this Windows laptop which we'll be using for, of course, the webinar and the demonstrations. So in the first demonstration I'm going to do, I'm just going to load a shape file of um, boundaries into PostGIS. From Centre Support, I've downloaded some Scottish Council areas. And what I'm going to do is load them into a PostGIS spatial database that we have access to. And I said there are lots of different methods of doing this. I'm just going to look at one method, which is a nice, easy way of doing this. And then once we've done that, we'll see how the data is actually stored in PostGIS. So let me just drop out the presentation here. Let me first just open a... Postgres itself comes with an administrative tool that lets you uh, admin, uh, admin on Postgres databases. So basically, there's a bunch of... There's a list of different types of data set, databases I have on this machine. I've already set up a database called James, because my name's James. And within this, I've created various schemas. Schema are just, are just a way of partitioning the data in the database. At the minute, you can see it when no tables loaded. So let's just load some data. So I'm looking for my PostGIS tools. So when you install PostGIS on Windows, it gives you this. It gives you like a PostGIS importer and export manager tool, which will allow you to upload shapefiles into your Postgres database. 
this is what this tool is. If you do this in Linux or Win, I think on Macs, you don't get this nice GUI tool, but you get command line tools which should do the similar sort of thing. So the first thing I have to do is tell uh, the tool where my database is. So let me just do that now. Okay, there's two tabs here. So there's an import tab and an export tab. I won't use the import tab because I want to import the shapefile. So I'll just navigate to my data, which I've got on my desktop. And I've got two shapefiles here. The one I want in this is a Scottish one here. So I know to get I know to set two options. I first need to tell the, the SRID is a special reference identifier. And that just tells the post just which, which what type of the, the spatial reference system is like is it British National Grid or is it like a, is it data for America or Australia? It just tells the, the spatial reference of that data. So I know this is British National Grid and this uses like a code of two seven zero zero. Um, I have to tell it which scheme I want to put the data into, so that's like the partition in the database where the data is to be stored. So I had the UKDS one set up, so that's what I want to use. I've confirmed that, that's all I need to do. I could add multiple shapefiles here by doing this and have them queued up, but I'm just going to add one. And I just run this import statement. I can see it very quickly, it's done something. If I go back to the PG admin and do a refresh, you can see that it's now loaded the data as a new table. If you look at the table, you can see what's, like, how the table's been created. You can see we've got various columns here. We've got an identifier column. We've got a GUID column. That's like the, in the presentation, that's the unique ID for the, the geographic area, which tells us how we can relate um, the center stats to it. The name is a, a is a place name of that geographic area. But importantly, we have this geometry column, and that's the that's the GIS part. That's the geometry, the the, the polygon extent of that output area, or in this case, a calculated area. And it's through that that we can we can map the data and do spatial analysis, etc. The importer has always also added an index to our data, and that just uh, means that the uh, features on that table can be accessed quickly. Um, just check. So that's great. We can actually, because it's a database, we can query the table. Just as we, as we would any other sort of data set, any other database. So the PG admin tool comes with like a a GUI that allows you to type in SQL queries and stuff. If you use that access, it's a similar sort of thing. Um, but what we can do is we can post just provides all these um, special functions that allow us to manipulate the spatial data itself. And I can just do like an order or something. So. And if I run that, you can see it pulls back the results from the table. So again, you can see I've got the GUI identifier, so that uniquely identifies each record. Uh, it tells you where it is, and because I've run this on a function called SDS text, it's worked out this from the geometry, the centroid point of that polygon. So you can see we want to use um, just purely using PostGIS to do GIS type functionality on our data. We could have done this in a GIS application like QGIS or ArcGIS, but it's really nice just to, to get your data purely through SQL by running queries. So that's a really nice feature. Um, so I'd go back to this presentation. So the next thing is like, how do we actually then view our, our data from PostGIS? And to do this, we can use the QGIS desktop GIS application. So again, like PostGIS, it's really easy to, easy to install QGIS. It comes with executables that just allow you to, to... It's quite a hefty download. I think it's like 300 megabytes on Windows. And then you just run the executable, and it will install QGIS on your Windows application, on your Windows computer, or your Mac, or your Linux. 
and then you get this really cool nifty desktop JS application. Having I've already pre-installed it, so if I just fire up QGIS now. So let's wait for QGIS to open. There you go. So I've got version 2.18. QGIS is quite actively developed, so you, find, you might find the version number increases quite rapidly. I think they are, the next major release will be QGIS version 3, which will be really quite nice in terms of what it does. OK, so it opens QGIS. So there's various menus on the top, like the main map window here, and some various panels at the side. But we just want to add some data from our PostGIS database to QGIS. So we have different types of data we can add from the left here. And for Postgres, PostGIS, we have the big elephant symbol. So I just need to tell QGIS where my PostGIS data is. So I've already set up a connection here. I'll just edit that. So this just tells QGIS where my database is. So OK. I'll just connect. Give it my password. And I just simply pick my table, which I've added to QGIS using that tool. And there we go. There's our PostGIS data within QGIS. And I, this, I can just select, I can click on the various features of the boundaries. I can see the properties, or I can see the entire table right open the actual table. So that's great. We can have our data stored in PostGIS, and we can access it from QGIS. So one of the common tasks of NGIS, and especially using census data, is you might have your boundaries, and then you might have aggregate data in a CSV table, and you want to be able to join them so you can do some sort of so you can map the census data by geography. And this is this is a task of joining data. You basically have like the in the polygons you have like a unique identifier, and the CSV data you have the same unique identifiers, and you simply want to join the two tables. So we can do that in QGIS quite easily, which I'll just show. Basically, you go to you, this, you go to the properties of the layer. In fact, let's first add the CSV file. So, so I first have to add a CSV file of my census stats. Again, use a QGIS dialog here. I have to pick no geometry because the stats don't contain a geometry column. If I open the attribute table, you can see all the census stats. You can see this geographic identifier, which uniquely identifies each row. Again, you've got name, and you've got, you've got various stats from, pop, from left to right. So here we've got population 11. I think this is like um, data to do with housing and stuff. So we have like the number of people who rented from local authorities, who rented from a local authority, from a housing authority, from a private landlord and stuff, or, or owner occupiers and stuff. And we simply want to join those stats to the boundaries. So we go to the properties of the boundaries. There's a join area here. And we simply want to add a new join. So we select the data we want to join to the polygons, which was our CSV of census stats. This one here. And we just have, we have to tell QGIS in which columns contain those same geographic identifiers. Okay, and just apply that. We okay that. And now, if you do that, we can see that the, the stats have now been joined to the polygons. Now, you could also, because this data is in PostGIS, you could load your CSV directly into PostGIS and just do it in Postgres itself. But some people find it easier just using the GUI and QGIS to do this. So it's just different ways of doing the same thing. So that's great. We've joined our stack to our boundaries. And now we maybe want to look at doing some actual visualization. So the first thing you do is visualization non-geographically. You could create bar charts and stuff, or pie charts, or pictograms almost. But because we've got the data geographically, you want to do some sort of spatial mapping, So, such as a chloroplast map. Here's an example here for London. I think this shows the percentage of people working more than 14 hours per week in London as recorded in the UK 2011 census. And this being the city of London, you can see that the highest percentage is in the city of London. That's all the bankers and stuff. 
working at long hours, whereas in that central London, as you get towards the suburbs, people are working fewer hours. But for, before we do this, we're going to do some sort of mapping fundamentals. The first thing to look at is actually how we classify data. So we, we have like a, ra a, number, a range of um, data variables, and the classification part is simply simplifying that range of data into categories in order to allow us to recognize patterns in that data. So we have like here a bunch of data from 3 to 93, and we just want to simplify that data into five classes. So here in my class, I have a class from 3 to 20, 21 to 38, 39 to 56, 57 to 74, and 75 plus. So we've simplified the range of data into five classes. And obviously by choosing a different number of data classes, and how we allocate the individual data to those classes will produce different sort of maps. The other thing is styling data. So again, here are our five categories, and then we just choose the sort of colors to apply to those um, categories or to map them. And again, we have all kinds of choice here. We could have like a, a linear, we go from white to black. So small data values have a light value, large ones have a darker value. And there's various choices here. Um, this color brewer to, to, tool is really nice to try and pick the optimum sort of um, color um, style to apply to your data. Uh, I think QGIS actually has plugins that allow you to use color brewer. So that's something to look for. So where are you going to do that? create a color path map um, using QGIS? So again, the color path map shade area to display statistical variables. So again, from QGIS, you just use the properties of the layer. And we go up to style, and let's go. We want to go to the graduated option, and when you pick the sort of um, variable you want to map. I think this is diff M, which I think is the difference in mortgages between 2001 and 2011. So if I just classify that, and I just apply it, and there we are, our color path map. And this being QGIS and a GIS mapping application, you can actually create a, a print hard copy of this. So it's called a print composer in QGIS. So it basically allows you to lay out how you want to uh, sort of map your Python maps here, which you might want to include in a report or something. So okay. So let's just change the portrait. And just add a new map. So you can see it dumps the view from our main QGIS window into this layout. And you can play around with this. Um, it's a bit, you can do things like, um, let's just, okay. So we can recenter that and we can add some map essentials like a key and a North arrow and a scale bar extension. So we can just drag this on. So there's our scale bar. We obviously need a key so that we can tell what the various colors mean. They call it a legend here. And give them a title. So we can just drag on a text box. So I And I can tweak the font and stuff. And because this is like um, uh, our center data is under the Open Government License, we have to write an attribution statement that indicates where the data came from. So when you download data from the UK Data Service, it will always come to a Terms and Conditions document, and that will tell you the attribution statement you have to use. So uh, and here is. And from the boundary data selector, it's called terms.html. So if I just open that with Firefox, you can see you've got this attribution statement here, which I'll just copy into QGIS. So let's add some more text. That's another text box in fact. Increase the size of that so it's a bit more legible and stick that at the bottom. 
So it's not massively exciting, but again, we just dumb that it was a PDF or something. So, and see it's created something. So great, that's our our map. That we could again we could dump into uh, into a report that we're writing or something. So chlorophyll maps are one way of visualizing data. Another way of visualizing census data is a thing called a cartogram. And a cartogram instead of the we just shading the the areas by the variable, we actually manipulate the areas themselves according to that variable. So there are two types of cartogram. There's a distance cartogram and an area cartogram. A distance cartogram is a classic example. A distance cartogram is the tube map in which the distance between the stations is not geographic distance. It is actually the time between those stations. So that, so that Bond Street and Marble Arch are relatively short apart from each other, but he's much further apart. But it doesn't really represent true geographic distance. Um, with an area cartogram, we simply we distort the actual geometries according to the variable being shown. So here the big circles are like large population and the small ones are small population. But we still maintain the relationship between the areas. So we still see that Texas is near beside Louisiana and Washington, Oregon and California still sit in each other. And cartograms are quite heavily used in like um, socioeconomic data. They, they feature quite heavily in the media um, publication of data related to the last EU referendum. So as the Guardian created these um, cartograms showing the the result, and we well widely used for census data as well. So there's a great book called People and Places by Danny Dolling and Bethan Thomas, which uses cartograms extensively to show census stats for the 2011 census. And it's really quite a different way of viewing the data. Unfortunately, QGIS comes with a a plugin which will allow you to create these sort of cartograms for census data. So we're going to look at doing that now because that's a different way of viewing the data other than a chloropleth map. We're basically going to create this sort of thing on the right here using our QGIS plugin, and then you can sort of compare it with your chlorophyll map. Um, you can see the problem with the chlorophyll map is like the areas of pop large population like Edinburgh and Glasgow you can hardly see because they're swamped by the bigger areas. Whereas the karst ground, the, the they will grow, and, and it's a lot easier to see where the major areas are. So these white bits here, it does distort the geography quite a lot, but it still maintains relationships between neighbouring areas. So it's still quite a, a nice way of viewing the data. So we'll just look at how you do that in QGIS. I'm going to use the same data set, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to save it to PostGIS so I can use it in this plugin. So to do that, there's a feature in QGIS called the DB Manager. And that will allow us to save our data that we've joined to, to PostGIS. I can do this. I have to tell it what data to save. And I'm going to call this Scotland Web Stats. Okay. Okay. And what I can do is I just get rid of these. Because we're done with that. Yep. We're done with that. I'll just re-add that post year's data. And it's this new one here. And just verify that we've not lost any data on no, you can see we've got our stats that we downloaded before. And what this is quite a powerful feature of QGIS is that it comes as well as the standard functionality that you get when you download it, there's also a, a range of additional like they call them plugins which are additional community developed functionality that individual people have created and extend the functionality of QGIS. So it makes it really quite powerful. Um, one of the ones we're going to use is a cartogram one. So to install the plugins, you go to this plugins manager install and you, it tells you all the plugins you've installed. And you can see I've already installed this cartogram one. It has to connect to some external website, so sometimes it can be, it can be quite slow. It's thinking about it.
Okay. And when you click on the links, it'll just tell you some various things about the cartogram. Um, so this is the sort of thing we're going to create using this plugin. That's great. But I've already installed it, so to access it, I need to go to the vector. And when you install the plugin, it adds different menus and stuff. So I'm going to create cartogram. And I'm going to use the same variable as before, which I think was this DFM thing. And then you can sit there, it sits here in the background creating our cartogram. And it may finish at some point. Any luck? Okay, yep, that's finished. So here's our cartogram. Again, we can style it up, make it a bit more easy to see what's going on. Um, So, yeah, there's our styled cartogram, and it's just an alternative way of viewing the data. Um, some people don't like cartograms. I think they're a nice way of viewing the data. And the final bit of demonstration I want to do, we're going to look at creating flow maps. So, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, um, the Wicked um, UK Data Service Center support application will allow you to download flow data, and that stuff will migration and stuff. And we're just going to use like, another QGIS plugin that will allow us to create flow maps from this data. So a flow map, you can see here that this is showing the, the migration of people from Leeds to the other, in terms of where they work. So they, they live in Leeds, and they work in all these other local authorities. And you see that most people which work in a non-Leeds will migrate to Bradford to work, or Wakefield, whereas less will say migrate to York. And these are quite a nice way of just exploring the flow data. But I'm going to use some different census data for this. So I go back to QGIS. I'm just going to get rid of these two data sets. And because we're running a quite short on time, I'm just going to add these as a shape file and a CSV file. So back to my desktop. So these are the boundaries. These are English and Welsh census merged local authorities. And I'm just going to add a CSV file of the actual flow data, which I think is this one. Again, yep. so if I open up the flow data, you can see we've got an origin and a destination on the flow. So that just tells us that 16,000 people, in terms of where they work and where they live, they, they, they live in this, this um, local authority and they work in this local authority. And all we want to do is I'm trying to visualize this on this data set by creating a flow map. So again, I'm going to use a plugin to do that. So I'm just going to open the plugins again. QGIS is thinking about it again. OK, so I'm using this plugin called rsins, which I think is French for snail or something. But again, if you look on the home page, it gives you the developer documentation. It's all in French, but you can basically tell what it's doing. It's creating these flow maps. And it's an origin origin destination of flux. So that's the sort of thing you want to create. And again, I've got it installed again, so I can just go to um, flow maps. And I just have to tear up the origin destination of the data I want to map. So. And if I do this now, you can see it's created some flows for leads. And because I've not mapped, I don't have flow data for the entire country. I just want to isolate the local authorities that we do have data for. So to do that, I'm going to do a very, I'm going to do some spatial analysis and just simply do select all the polygons which intersect with the flow lines. So analysis. Uh, spatial query, that's the one we want. Yep. So we just want to get QGIS to select all of the local authority districts which intersect with the flow lines and create a new selection. 
so you can see that it's done that. And I'm just going to create a new layer. No, it did work. I just didn't. Oh, okay. Right. Um. Okay, that's worked this time. So so there we have our smaller selection of local authorities. And again I can just I can tweak the properties of this data to make things nicer. So And I can do things like I can show the labels of the features. So that's great, that's our flow map. And again we can see that the majority of people in the leads who don't who don't live and work in leads are migrating for work to Bradford and then to Wakefield and then far fewer are migrating for work to Doncaster, York or Harrogate. So that's just one way of that you can create a visualization in, in QGIS of the full data.